There are some people that don't really want autonomy over their own lives, that prefer to let their doctors do the worrying for them, or who are squeamish or whatever. However, there's another group of us, and I used to think we were a minority, but now I'm starting to think that actually we may be the majority after all, that want autonomy over our own bodies. We want to like our bodies and feel comfortable in them and feel in control over our own lives. Men have the advantage of looking at their genital area a couple of times during the day, sometimes even more. Um, <laughs> whereas women can't look unless they have a speculum into this um, vaginal area so that they wouldn't notice if something came up. And we are trying to get away from the idea of authorities to demystify medicine, to be able to talk about um, our bodies so that we can know more about our own bodies and control our bodies, know what sort of information we need to know, what sort of information we need to find out. This is the, the speculum. Now, what you do is everybody has a different way of putting the speculum in. Some women prefer to have some lubrication. Again, whatever is most comfortable. Little kids love them, you know. Quack, quack. <laughs> really. One, one woman said she had to get two speculums, one for her little boy and one for her. <laughs> so anyhow, clip it together like this, and it opens it up. All right? Opens up. Then you pull up. This is where the directions get hard. It's easier if you have one of your own to play with. You pull up on the back and press down the front, and it locks it. Okay? And it stays. It's locked. It, it won't come undone. Okay, so what I'm going to do, because it's not very comfortable to sit up, is I'm going to lie down, put my legs up. And I put the speculum in, and you just put it in like a tampon. Now, I'm used to putting in the speculum. I do it all the time. So I don't usually have too much trouble finding my cervix. Sometimes you gotta, when you put it in, you put it in up to the pubic bone and jiggle it around a little bit, like it doesn't hurt, so that you can feel, so that your cervix pops into view. Sometimes you've got to try a couple times until you find your cervix. Don't get discouraged. So I've got it in, and I'm going to click it open. There we go. And there's my cervix, which looks healthy. And if we can work a traffic flow here of people coming through, I promise I'll stay here for as long as everybody wants. Everybody will get a chance to see a cervix. We found in self-help groups, when we are actually honest with ourselves and with other people, that women don't even examine their outer genital areas because of all the mysticism and taboos that have been passed down to us. We don't want to think about that area. We don't want to talk about that area. We don't want to touch that area. Just hearing other women talking about experiences that they've had, that you've gone around for, you know, 20 years thinking, I'm the only one that's like this, and always in the back of your head thinking that you're some kind of horrible freak, and that if this information ever got out to the public, it would be the ruin of you forever. You know, when you're in a group and you, and you hear women going around the room talking about having the same sort of feelings, it's, you can laugh at it then. It's something that, yeah, I'm really used to, like, two years ago, somebody had told me that I was going to be doing this. I would have turned purple and hid in a closet. Is it tipping? Usually it comes pretty much straight on. But when I've had the speculum in for a while, it starts tilting back. Like, one time in Michigan, we were doing presentations, like, three presentations a day, and I was so tired that my cervix, like, just keeled over. And this is, I think, something that has really helped me being involved in self-help groups, is just being able to understand how my body is functioning and why it's functioning that way, and I'm not afraid of it anymore. Down a little. Uh, 
definitely have their place. There are situations where you need to be in a hospital, you need to be in a situation where you can handle an emergency. But the attitude that I, that I find talking to nurses and doctors and, and seeing this and seeing the nurse's reaction and seeing how doctors treat the patients, it's like the doctor has the baby. It's not the mother. The mother doesn't deliver the baby. The mother doesn't take care of the baby. They take all that experience away from the mother. What time is it? Didn't anybody get the time? Oh. A little medication that the mother gets, so there's some effect on the, on the baby. And, mo and what I've observed is that they're much sleepier. They're not very active at all. And also like the mothers that I, that I saw that were drugged, it seems sort of like remote from the experience. Midwives are really, really needed because it's women. It's women helping women deliver their children. Really need that, you know. Really need women to 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 share this this experience and to teach them, you know, teach teach you how to how your body functions and how to deal with it. But in this state, midwives can't practice. It's illegal. It's been so for 25 years. I felt very psychologically healthy here. I was had very much support just having my friends around just as like a cheering thing. <laughs> the average woman has contact with a gynecologist at very crucial times in her life. And these are times where if she can make her own decisions and feel good about herself, it would do so much to increase her sense of competence, her sense of autonomy, her sense of womanhood and personhood and self-respect, and also her sense of herself as a sexual being. First part we'll do is a culture, and then we'll do a pap smear, and then we'll fit your diaphragm. Okay. okay. You're gonna just let your legs go wide apart. You're gonna feel me touching the pubic hair down here. I've had a lot of pelvics, and most of them have been really unpleasant experiences. There's a really bad association in my head with lying on that table with my feet up in the stirrups. For a Peterson speculum to be used, that's been warmed if it's made of metal, it's somewhat more comfortable. Mm -hmm. First thing we'll do here is the culture, and then I'll smear that right away on a culture plate. You should have the results from that in 48 hours. Well, next to you, pass me here. I only remember one other pelvic, and the doctor was a woman, in which the doctor talked to me while I was having the pelvic. I heard of a doctor who um, always turns on a fan um, before he performs a pelvic. And I know that, that the kind of socialization that I got led me for, for many of the pelvics that I had to feel sorry for the doctor. Right, for this awful thing that he had to do, which was to look at my vagina. I'm not interested in going to a doctor who feels that way. Taking the speculum out now. Okay. Now I'm just going to examine your uterus and ovaries for position, size, and tenderness. Mm -hmm. 
I think that medical education in general teaches men to have a very distorted impression of what women are. And I think that women medical students are more likely to question it since when they learn it, um, they have to apply the information they're learning to themselves. It's not just this sort of external group of, of female patients. It's very hard to get out of the role of being a passive consumer. You are tempted to, to expect a doctor to be able to, to do everything and, and be a god. Once you get used to treating a doctor like a person, you begin to feel pretty ridiculous treating a doctor any other way. And everything seems to be fine. Most of the things that are, are done to us are done without our real informed consent. We're not told the risks of surgery we undergo. We're not told the alternatives. Uh, the same is true of most drugs that we're given. And um, I think that our rights are violated all the time by most doctors. Not all. There's a small percentage who are very um, concerned. Exposure on anatomy. Mm -hmm. We have good... Uh... The anesthesia, I must compliment you again, the anesthesia is absolutely delightful. Can we put a permanent request in for you? I happen to be a very conservative surgeon, and I don't recommend removal of organs if they can be conserved. It does decrease the blood loss, you know? In this case, there really is no alternative to the type of surgery she had. Now, the disease that Mrs. Uh, Zaran has, uh, carcinoma of the cervix, and it's in situ or pre-invasive stage, is a very serious matter. Uh, a colonization, in other words, extensive biopsies were carried out, and the changes were such that a uh, hysterectomy was definitely the best treatment for her. Fortunately, this woman's disease had not progressed to an incurable stage. Okay. Okay, now the next step is... Uh Carcinoma in situ in a younger woman can sometimes be managed by colonization or extensive uh, in-hospital biopsy of the cervix, not requiring hysterectomy. But that patient thereafter must be followed very closely with pap smears repeated at six monthly intervals. Well, the coming off the... Yeah, some of the veins are coming off the high Yeah. Well, maybe it's superior vessels. Well, superior vesicles up here. Another schnitt. And then zero silk cayenne pants. Uh, certainly the patient always makes uh, their own decisions in the end, but the patient has to understand um, the seriousness of the matter, the seriousness of the solution, and what will be the outcome if uh, nothing is done. Now, if a, if a woman does not agree with or feels uncertain or unsure of the advice she's getting from one physician, it's she's certainly within her rights to go and get another opinion. It basically is a contract of trust. In the same way you, as you trust uh, your lawyer if he makes out your income tax return or your accountant. And if the patient finds out she doesn't have that trust in her physician, uh, then she best try another physician. There have been a lot of studies done for United Mine Workers Union, Teamsters Union, various unions whose executives became concerned about the fact that there were so many hysterectomies being done as soon as the unions bought health insurance for their members. One of the studies that I consider the most unimpeachable was done at the Columbia School of Public Health for uh, the Teamsters Union in New York City. It was done by Dr. Ray Trussell, Dr. Mildred Moorhead, and Dr. Alan Guttmacher. And they concluded that of the hysterectomies performed on the wives of members of the uh, Teamsters Union during a certain period, that a third were clearly unnecessary and another 10% were highly questionable. It seems that the organ that is most disposable is the uterus. So I would advise a woman and, and conservative doctors who are concerned about these practices all say the same thing, never to get a hysterectomy without getting at least another opinion. In the field of birth control, which is the field that I know the most about, um, there's like a little clique of powerful people who move around and they go from the foundations to the drug companies to government agencies like HEW and they give out the money and control the research. So to give you an example of how this kind of thing works, 
uh, there's a man named Dr. Joseph Goldsier. He poured chicana women who come to his clinic for birth control. He gave, he, he gave them all pills. Only half of them got dummy pills. And in that group, 10 or 11 got pregnant. Uh, and it was never made clear to them that they were um, participating in an experimental study. She was told she was having her tubes tied and that she could have them undone whenever she wanted. She has asked to have them undone, and now they told her that her tube, it was not tied, it was clipped, which gives her a lesser possibility of her ever becoming pregnant. A uh, lesser problem that happens here on for life. You know, you hear about you have my tubes tied, it seems like you tie it up like a ribbon and undo it. But it's, it's not the same thing as that. And until the doctors sit down and explain to you what they're going to do to your body, what is the recourse, any of what after effect, I think it's wrong for anyone to go into these things without fully knowing what's the possibility. Right. I think I went over the case with Pearl yeah. in detail. But, you know, what kinds of things can we look at? How can we go about making sure these kind of things don't happen? You know what? They, they have a way. I think these attitudes are built in. They, and it's like, sometimes I think that, that people try to make you pay for being poor and make you pay for being black. Mm -hmm. And make you pay for being, you know, a woman. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that's, you that's a problem. You know, if you, you know, okay, the thing, you go to the hospital and I walk down and I really terrible pain in my stomach. Terrible pain. <laughs> I go in and say, oh my goodness, doctor, what's wrong? I don't know, I'm just in terrible pain, my stomach is killing me. So he says, don't you know what's wrong with you? <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> ah, come on, you know what's wrong with you. And I said, wait a minute. No, I don't know what's wrong with me. And never mind, give me my clothes, let me get out of here. Oh, wait a minute, maybe, maybe I was wrong about it. Oh, wrong about yeah. what? I mean, his insinuation, you know. I must have been one of those. You know, I've got to be one of them because it came in my yeah. stomach hurt, so right away I'm either the prostitute or I'm either got some kind of bad disease. Mm -hmm. They haven't even touched me. I'm supposed to tell him why my stomach is killing me. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, because if you look a certain way, you know, okay, so if you're, you're unwealthy, you don't look so run down mm -hmm. and old. And if you look like nice, fairly good, you're a prostitute. Mm -hmm. <laughs> If you're poor, you're too poor when you've been out messing around, coming around anyways. <laughs> you may want BD, everybody got it. Everybody, everybody, got everybody BD. has BD. They BD, give them the penicillin. Don't even wait to find, you know, hey, if you got a cramp, give them the penicillin because we got BD. Send them to the A clinic. <laughs> yeah, that's the Send them to the A clinic. L clinic. Right, buddy. Send them to the L clinic. You go up there and you find everybody you know sitting at the L clinic. <laughs> oh, I came in because my stomach was hurting. I had a sore throat. How'd you get to the L clinic? Well, it's yeah, a sore throat. Right away, you know what's wrong with that. And then the thing about it, just by the name, this L clinic, I don't know what the L stands for, but everybody knows when you go to L clinic, you being tested for BD. You go to the L clinic, you get your lumps, because they shoot you up the penicillin, they put lumps on you like arms. Well, you know, the whole attitude about people, it is really, really bad. What it does is people... It turns them off from getting health care. It does. If you it's need really health care, you don't even want to go get it. If you have to go through all of those hassles, well, I, I that's why I go. Last last minute, last 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 I wait until it's really in the last that's minute. That's Half the time, I have to be pushed by my mother to go because I refuse. I mean, I really refuse to go over there and be hassled and, and looked so upon good. like I'm nobody. I am somebody. I mean, I have that much money, but I am somebody. I'm a right. That's What's right. One of the basic ideas conveyed in drug company advertising is that the male and the female are like a different species. And that whereas the male is a fairly strong character, the female is like a child. And what the doctor should do is pat her on the back and quite possibly drug her up. A very common type of drug ad in medical journals shows a, uh, a miserable looking woman. And the message is always, um, Doctor, get her off your back. Get her off her husband's back. Shoot her up and shut her up with our product. And then as the years pass, this goes on and on, um, so that when she gets to menopause, say, um, and she's wondering whether she should consider taking hormones, uh, if she's having menopausal symptoms, again, the chances are the doctor will say, uh, Absolutely, you must take them or you'll practically turn into a man, which is what some doctors such as Wilson, who wrote this book, Feminine Forever, claim. Or absolutely no, it causes cancer. 
uh, again, she's not treated like an adult person who, who is told the benefits and the risks and allowed to make her own choice. More than half of all women have lumps in their breast at some phase in their life, most commonly during the active phase of their ovaries, the reproductive part of their life. I had an experience a few years ago where I discovered a lump in one of my breasts. And the way that I dealt with it, essentially, was by not dealing with it, by playing possum with it, by believing that it really didn't exist and it was going to go away. Cancer, on the other hand, is relatively rare in women under 40. It increases in frequency and it occurs most, starts appearing most frequently after the menopause from 55 on. I was about to leave for Puerto Rico with my husband in 1966 when I went for a routine checkup to my doctor and he discovered a lump in my breast to, to my astonishment because I thought that I had been doing a regular checkup on myself and had been very careful, but there it was. So I went then to a, another, to a surgeon. The doctor has a lot of trouble in differentiating benign and malignant lesions. The surgeon told me that um, he felt that if I were his daughter, he would have it removed. The result often is that biopsies are done on benign lesions that might not need to have been done. He said, um, well, we take the lump out, and then if we do a frozen section, and if it is malignant, we then can, we proceed and remove your breast. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, I was presented with consent forms. Um, one said that if uh, difficulties were encountered and the physician felt that a partial mastectomy should be performed, I gave consent to that. Um, and the other was a consent form that if a radical mastectomy, mastectomy was deemed necessary, that I would allow that to be done. And I looked at him standing there and I thought, you don't have any idea what you're saying. You have not any conception of what, what this means. I mean, you tell me I'm going to go to sleep. You're going to, I'm not going to know what's going to happen to me. You're going to take off my breast. You're going to take out my glands. You're going to strip my muscles. And then I'm going to wake up. And I have, without any preparation for it at all, well, I was frantic. No longer should a, the surgeon or the hospital ask a patient who comes in for a breast biopsy to sign a paper saying that if it turns out to be malignant, uh, uh, the surgeon has her permission to go ahead and do a mastectomy. Nobody had discussed this with me. I really didn't expect this at all. I found it very frightening but I signed the forms. We know now that a so-called frozen section carried out at the time of the operation does not permit the pathologist to see the things that we need him to look at. The old treatment was radical mastectomy. That's all we had. It was 100% mutilation. But that operation is now out not just because it was mutilating, but because it is no longer as satisfactory. It's not as good as we can do. And I waited and I tossed at night and I, you know, finally in the middle of the night, I thought that I did have a choice because I, we do have a family surgeon. And in this case, I could get another opinion. And he examined me and he said that he did not believe in the major mastectomy that what his procedure was, was simply to incise the lump and then treat the patient with radiation. There are new treatments appearing, and these treatments are better than the old traditional. But most, most important is that the new treatments permit the woman to retain her breast. The appearance can be fixed up. You could wear a false breast, and if you're uncomfortable, it still looks the same. But it's a much, much deeper thing than that. It's femininity itself. It's a woman's sense of herself, of her sense as a whole. Perhaps the most frightening element in this whole episode was waking up in recovery, coming out of the anesthesia, not knowing what had been done, and instinctively reaching over to feel my breast, 
finding a bandage, not having any idea what was going on underneath the bandage. This is very difficult for men to realize because they, their concept perhaps is somewhat different. But if they could apply it to themselves, then they would find that they also didn't want to lose parts of their body which had to do with their maleness. And, and perhaps if we'd had more women surgeons, uh, we wouldn't have had, we would have had a change in this operation. As it happened, I was very fortunate. They were able to excise a lump, which in retrospect, it might not have even been necessary to take out in the first place. And so the important point is that there is a choice and that women must exercise that choice. They must find out what is possible for them. And if this means having two or three opinions, that's it. And we must also have information as to what choices there are. And even if there aren't any choices, we must still choose. We must still say, wait, wait. Let's find out about this. Pat, my name is Janet Young, and I'll be your counselor today. Well, I'd like to begin by telling you um, some of the tests that we'll do today and everything that will happen. Um, Today, but I guess before I go into that, we should talk about whether you're sure that you um, do want to terminate this pregnancy. Well, I have other children, and I just can't afford any more. Okay, and is that your own decision? Yes. Okay. Then I'd like to tell you about the, the EUE procedure. And uh, the first thing... A group of women from the community got together and discussed the fact that there were women interested in a consumer-run, consumer-oriented clinic. There were some physicians in town interested in doing abortions, and we were also concerned that the general women's health needs of the area weren't being met, not just abortion needs. So we were hoping that it would be a pretty in general women's health care place eventually. We got together and got everything together in about a thousand women hours of planning. The uh, center started with oh, about 10 women. A lot of help from a lot of people. But the idea of the center was that there would be no hierarchy and that it would be a collective. I think everybody at the center would agree that we think health care should be free. But right now we're run strictly off patient fee. And so what we try to do is try to work it so that women pay according to their income and number in the family on a sliding scale basis. What happens next is that this cannula, which is very flexible, is inserted into your uterus and it's connected to a syringe like this. And with a motion like this, we draw back on the syringe and the contents of your uterus are drawn, drawn into the vacuum that's created. Um, and with a motion like that, but all the walls of the surfaces of your uterus are covered and the lining is drawn into the syringe. Okay. We're Those just going to do the gonorrhea culture minutes. first. About three minutes. Okay. All right? Yes. <coughs> now I'm just going to wash your cervix with some iodine. And you will probably notice some yellow staining afterwards, okay? Mm -hmm. so it's a little wet and squishy and maybe a little cold. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. I'm going to do it again. Okay, that's fine. Now the next thing I have to do, Pat, is just to hold on to your cervix. So that I can control things, all right? Okay. And you will probably feel that. It's like a hard pinch or like a cramp, but it won't last very long. Okay? Mm -hmm. Did you feel that? Yeah, we did. Okay. Now I'm going to insert a cannula in your uterus, and usually you feel like a hard menstrual cramp. Try to stay as relaxed as possible. Okay. Okay. And now it's where it takes three minutes, okay? You will probably feel some cramping. And we're going to empty your ears. Squeeze things into my hand. Go slow, deep press, and 
going to hear a noise now, okay? I'm going to take the candle out of the ears and I'm going to do it again. Is I'm going to do it again, baby. Yeah, well, it doesn't really. I'm going to do it again, Pat, okay? Okay. I know you're okay. feeling cramped. Yeah. You probably feel these more she use cream scan. Mm -hmm. Just keep up slow. Deep press. It doesn't last. And what time? Okay, now your uterus feels empty and I'm going to take a cannula out. We're done. We're done. Okay? One thing I found out that was very interesting that two out of ten high school people will get syphilis before they will get VD before they graduate and not know it. Three out of every ten, ten actually get VD, right. but but two, two out, out of ten, ten don't no know idea when they have it. When they that's get. that's pretty frightening. Yeah. <laughs> it's absolutely frightening. And it, it what's amazing about it is is that when when we as students, when we as people, when we as women say, this is an important issue, venereal disease is almost in e epidemic proportions. Our school says, our school newspaper says, no, I'm sorry, you may not print the initials VD in any place. Yeah. So what we did is we mimeographed off sheets saying what we were doing and, and why we felt it was important and a fancy slogan to say, do you know your body? What do you know about your body? And we ended up hanging them on the inside of the stalls in the girls' bathroom. Because <laughs> that was the only place, the, the only safe place for it, that, that we thought they'd remain there the longest before getting torn down. So it was completely underground. I have no one to talk to about, you know, medical things and everything. You can't go to doctors, really, if you don't have anything wrong with you. You can't go and just want to talk to them. Right. And um, my friends didn't know really as much as I did either, you know. We didn't know anything. And I figured in a group, we could all look it up and study it and help each other out. And share the information. Right. right. And we'd all know what we do need to know. We all have bits and pieces. Right. And, and, we we and when you put them together, you've got it. Right. There's another group of us. And I used to think we were a minority, but now I'm starting to think that actually we may be the majority after all that want autonomy over our own bodies. We want to like our bodies and feel comfortable in them and feel in control over our own lives. 